So students, if you can, please put on your videos because the panelists would love to see you. And once they get some face-to-face -face interactions with you as well, it's beneficial for making any future connections with them, possibly on LinkedIn. And of course, mention the event and something that you enjoyed about what they had said. Uh, I'll pass it off to the amazing Professor Lovenow, who I'd love to introduce as starting the QCAN prog program of dispute resolution at Cardozo. We would not be number five in the dispute resolution program across law schools without her. She started the mediation clinic over 20 years ago, which I have had the privilege of being in. And I'm also her research assistant this year. And I can tell you that she is an amazing, outstanding woman who could not be <laughs> as nice and fabulous as she is. Um, it's been a true pleasure and I hope that any of you who are planning on doing any ADR work in the future at Cardozo have the opportunity to work with her. She is teaching a class right now called the Innovations in Justice and there are some students here who I'm sure will be willing to tell you how fan fabulous that class is as well. So with that being said, I'll pass it off to Professor Love to moderate this event. Okay, thank you so much. What a nice introduction. But I would say, you know, the real strength of Cardozo's program is our alumni and we're gonna see that in action um, this evening. It has been such a pleasure over the years working with Cardozo students. I think we are the best. We have, um, I think, helped each other promote both our program, but dispute resolution nationally and internationally. Let me say just a very little about um, each of our panelists tonight and say to everybody, please, take notes, take names, take, you never know when you might want to reach out to someone. And if you can reach out with a gracious comment, compliment um, about what you liked about what they said this evening, you, you've, you know, you've made a connection that's meaningful. So Krista Hartley is um, alphabetically the first on my list. Um, Krista was the student fellow for the QCAN program, which Kristen is now. And I, that kind of makes the point to everybody, if you want a career in a field, just get involved. You're gonna meet people and get ideas via involvement. And then if you do that, do as good a job as Krista Hartley did and Kristen is doing, and they will forever be grateful. Um, Krista is now clerking for a judge. Um, while she was at Cardozo, she was the editor-in-chief of our really wonderful ADR competition, Honor Society, which sends students all over the world, all over the United States and all over the world to compete. Um, Camilla. Lopez is a Cardozo graduate who is right now volunteering as a mediator in small claims lawsuits. And I'm actually emphasizing that one point because of the word volunteer. Volunteer and you get expertise. Volunteer and you meet people. Volunteer and you get people who are going to be very, very grateful to me. Um, she, her, her, day, her day job is as a legal justice tech. She co-founded a company, this is really impressive, called People Clerk, um, assisting self-represented people, um, litigants uh, with the small claims court process. Small claims court is supposed to be easy, it's not easy. Thank you, Camila Lopez, for identifying a, um, a point of need and turning that into a business. So you see that, I think, uh, looking at Camila's short bio, I think, wow, volunteering, being there, being creative is helpful. Winter Wheeler, uh, a, a litigator now in Atlanta, um, 
who has it, was reading Winter's bio and noting the affiliations she had. She's her leadership positions include the National Bar Association, the American Bar Association, the Lawyers Club of Atlanta, the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys, the Georgetown Club of Metro Atlanta. I've read half the list and I don't want to take all our time reading the list, but that, um, that level of participation if you identify the career area you want to be in, and it's available. If you're a student in Cardozo now, the um, New York City Bar, Dan Weiss, who you're going to meet in a moment, offices he's involved in, everybody wants um, volunteers. Um, Winter has so many credentials, I don't know. She, she's the co-author of a best-selling book at Networked. Um, she's a, a, got a thriving mediation practice. So I'm going to be very eager to hear um, from her. And Dan White's is probably a little annoyed because I said I was going to make this alphabetic and now I'm putting his last and his name is actually a little higher. Well, he can be annoyed. Dan has been a terrific friend and ally for um, my whole career at Cardozo, maybe not my whole career, but, but a big portion of it. He is a star in the dispute resolution field, leading the New York courts to adopt ADR. Now, as many of you know, there's presumptive um, dispute resolution, uh, presumptive ADR in the New York courts Dan is leading that, but his role in the courts has gotten broader than ADR. Um, his career now, because he's the New York leader, if you can do it in New York, you can do it anywhere. And it's taken him all over the world, uh, lecturing, teaching, training. And it's also taking him into uh, Cardozo classrooms. He's, he teaches in our mediation clinic as well as in other schools, um, not only in the city, but around the, around the country. So, and, and the world, actually. So, we have an amazing panel, and I'm gonna, I, I just sort of picked and chose little things about the resume to different people's resumes. So I hope each of the speakers will elaborate on what they've done that might be turned into advice for what others do and if others should do wanting a career in ADR because we have four very, very successful panelists. So. I want to ask a question first, though, which um, is just, in, I, I think, would intrigue students listening to this and maybe would be helpful in sort of explaining the traje trajectory of the careers, the four careers in front of us. Why did this field, ADR, dispute resolution, interest you? It was not in the mainstream, at least for the um, panelists who are slightly older, who have been out of law school for five to 10 years, it was not a ma mainstream thing. What about it interested you? Why, why have you become among the leaders in this field? And maybe we can, shall we just keep the same order or is somebody in the group desperate to answer this. The, the same order would be Krista. Sure. Um, I just want to first say thank you to Professor Love and all the other panelists and um, the ADR team and Dispute Resolution Society for hosting this event and inviting me. Um, it's really great to see students um, here on Zoom. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, in terms of you know 
why ADR, what kind of inspired me or what led me here is I don't think I fully realize and other students fully realize how crucial just in general skills that you learn from ADR courses or clinics or practitioners will take you not only in your career, but also in your life. You will really learn how to communicate with people and understand people, um, not just in the courtroom, but just in, in your everyday relationships. And that was really um, profound to me. When I did, I did the mediation clinic, my, my 2L year at Cardozo, and I remember being in, you know, the training with Professor Love, and I was like, wow, like, i translating these skills to my everyday relationships, and it's really improved them. So I think just getting into that, and also, practically speaking, as Professor Love mentioned, um, ADR is now supposed to be, you know, the first stop in New York courts. Um, I'm in New, I'm right over the river in New Jersey in Hudson County, and you have to go to mediation three times before you uh, go before a judge. So practically speaking, you will probably have to sit down with a mediator or an arbitrator or learn to negotiate with your adversary. So it's absolutely in, invaluable, in my opinion. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Krista. And yes. I'm looking at your attire and just <laughs> noticing how wonderful that is. And I want to apologize to everybody for mine. Anyway, Camilla, next. Uh, so I did warn uh, Dina and Krista, Kristen uh, before this panel that I am not in like the traditional ADR, but that said, like Krista, like I use my ADR skills in my career now. So the industry I'm in is some people would call it alternative, uh, like an alternative legal career. Um, in, in my industry, we call it legal tech. Um, I use my skills as a lawyer every single day. I'm at the intersection of how we can build technology tools to make the law more efficient. Um, I'm specifically in the area of B2C, which means my, like the technology we're creating is helping consumers have access to the courthouse. Um, and especially we're focusing on self-represented litigants, pro se litigants, AKA anyone without an attorney navigate the court system. Um, it involves, it, it specifically, it's in small claims, um, and many litigants have to mediate their cases. Um, some even just skip the whole process and go straight to arbitration. So I've built these tools to explain to them what is mediation, what is negotiation. Now courts are implementing online negotiation prior to the small claims hearing. The largest courthouse in the United States, the LA County Courts, just implemented this system of like a chat where you have to chat and negotiate before even assessing mediation or even going before a judge. So my job is to provide those litigants the tools to be able to resolve their case through one of those avenues. And just as, as like Krista mentioned, like my skills that I learned on the ADR team, Krista was actually my partner for ABA negotiation. Uh, I don't know who participated in that, but I use those skills every single day. And maybe when I was in the competitions, I was like, how am I ever going to use this? Like, what is this? Like, it's exactly what I do every day when I have to get a partnership with another company or even addressing the courthouse or, I mean, anything, every single thing I do, I've used my ADR skills. So I couldn't recommend like the ADR team enough and like the ADR programs that Cardozo offers. I wish I had done the mediation clinic. Now I'm a volunteer mediator at a court and that's something I didn't think I was going to be doing so early on in my career. Um, so really utilize those resources to your advantage. Um, I like, I mean, that's pretty much it. Wow, great. So Winter, why did you get interested in mediation as a field and arbitration? So I'm a little bit different from everybody else I've ever met who's in this field. <laughs> I wanted to be a mediator from, I don't know, maybe six months or so into my legal career, maybe a little longer than that, but for a very, very, very long time. It was, it was the dream, it was the goal, it was what I was setting out to do. 
Um, and I genuinely think it's what I'm on this planet for. So ADR is a huge part of my life. Um, I, you know, I started out not having any idea of what I wanted to do. I had no real um, desire to do anything specific um, when I graduated from law school. So I did a couple of different things and I ended up settling at a civil defense firm doing insurance defense, which I loved. Um, I, apparently, I mean, I did it for like 14 years. Um, but I was put in a position with this amazing, amazing boss who gave me so much hands-on experience. And I mediated all the time. I was always at mediation, maybe, maybe twice a week, one, two times a week. And it was fantastic. I realized that mediation days were my favorite days. And it wasn't because I was, <laughs> was out of the office. It was because I genuinely loved working through these problems and negotiating and getting things done. And so I ended up talking to one of the mediators that I used most often. And we talked about, you know, how he became a, a mediator and what it looked like to be a private mediator as a uh, relatively younger lawyer and how I could go about turning it into a successful, uh, profitable career that would replace my you know, law firm income immediately. And it was a very, very, very long-term track. And as a result, I, I did. I worked for literally 14 years as a um, defense attorney and got an opportunity that I could not say no to. And um, here I am at this point, it's been a, a little under a year and a half. So I've been pandemic, <laughs> pandemic business building. It's fantastic. I would, well, I mean, I'm joking, right? I wouldn't recommend it, but it's um, my story and how I got to be where I am right now is really the basis for my book here <laughs> networked. Um, you got to check that out. It's going to give you a lot of well, inf information about how I did this, but also information about what was talked about earlier about, about networking and uh, building your community, et cetera. I'm getting far afield of where we were, but anyway, I, that is how I became a mediator. I have always been a private mediator. I have never been a volunteer mediator. Um, I, I love mediation. I think mediation is, the the wave of the future. Um, I have a podcast about mediation and how it applies to everyday life. So the, I do take those skills and use them every day, all day when I'm dealing with my children, especially. especially. Um, but I think at at the end of the day, what what I'm best suited to answer is questions about how you how you would build your business and. Um, not bypass the the volunteer stage. I think that's very important. Um, I but like I said, I've never been a volunteer mediator. I have and do a lot of volunteering as part of building my business and building my network. So that is definitely important. It's a little bit different here in Georgia, where I'm physically located, where we do not have mandatory mediation. Um, when I started my career, when I decided I wanted to become a mediator, I was living in Florida where, where mediation is mandatory, not three times. I love that, by the way, three times, um, just once. Uh, but that's how it got started for me. Um, so any questions directed toward me should probably be kind of in the private mediation sector. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. I've been talking for a long time. Well, no, what you said was <laughs> terrific. Could you hold up your book? Do you have it right there? Oh, yes. Yes. She's always nearby. It's called Networked. You can find it on Amazon, hashtag Networked Book, if you're going to search. And all of the proceeds um, actually are going to charity. So it is an anthology written by me and my networking group. We are 20 20 women lawyers and we met at the start of the pandemic and we grouped together and we decided to be um, a supportive force for each other and and push each other forward and you know break the hell out of that linkedin algorithm and we did it we've had i mean it's a best-selling book i mean it's been out since um i want to say early october or late no early november or late october 
And um, it was number one for several, several weeks. And it's still like number six in one of its categories. So it's just off the chart. It's been amazing, a book tour, so many fun things. Thank you for letting me plug that. <laughs> so when your professors say, write, write a good paper, or write, write something for yeah. a competition, do it, do it. Yeah. Think of it as something fun <laughs> to do. Wow, Camilla Winter, wonderful. Now we're at um, Dan. So the original question was, and you don't have to answer these other answers or the additional answers are great, but what interested you in the first place in dispute resolution? Sure, it's a great question. And first, let me say, this is so much fun. I wanna thank you, Leela and, and Kristen and, and, and Gina for inviting me. I think when I first graduated, I was invited back a couple of times and I've been waiting about 20 years to be invited back. So thank you <laughs> so much. Um, also, you know, Professor Love, who's a friend and colleague, always describes me as a star. And, and I used to think that I was doing really cool things and being a trailblazer, but what a panel. I mean, being here with Krista and Camilla and Winter and hearing about all the things that you're doing, it's, it's humbling. And so it's, it's great to, to, I mean, weird to think of myself as maybe not the current generation of, of new ADR leaders, but um, what, an, what an awesome group. Um, you know, what got me started was really um, dispute resolution, I think more finding me than, than I found it. Um, I was in college when I discovered dispute resolution or conflict resolution, and I was a, a junior um, at NYU, actually, and, and was getting a little bit worried <laughs> as, as I was going to be graduating in a year, and I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I kept eliminating things every time I took a course and studied something. But I, I did know that I wanted to find something that I would be passionate, that I could be passionate about, but also would be an intellectual pursuit. I wanted to be able to do with empathy, whatever I was doing would include empathy. Um, and to make a long story short, I was in the sort of career counseling office at NYU, sitting in the counselor's office, talking about the ways I could spend my, um, uh, my senior year, actually, because I, I didn't do it my junior year. Uh, and we were talking about all different kinds of traditional uh, internships that you could do. The counselor had to leave for a second, left me in her office and in bookcases, just like the ones that I virtually have behind me, there was a piece of paper sticking out from a book. And that piece of paper said on it, Washington Semester Program Peace and Conflict Resolution Seminar. And she, her name was, Donna Don Johnson, actually, she came back into the room and I said, what's that, that thing? And she said, oh, that's new, I forgot all about it. That, that's this, you could go to Washington DC and take different internships at the Justice Department and journalism and things like that. And I said, no, that peace and conflict resolution thing, that sounds cool. Uh, so in my senior year of college, I visited at American University and studied peace and conflict resolution. Uh, and I was hooked, um, you know, I, I had, from there, gone um, uh, forming a not-for-profit with our professor at the time and went to South Africa and did workshops in nonviolent social change, conflict resolution, and community development. Um, so I found my passion. And then the next question was, well, how can I um, integrate this with intellectual pursuits? Do I join the Peace Corps? Do I get a graduate degree? And my mentors at the time had said, well, you know, there are these really amazing people in New York, among them this, this woman named Leela Love, who's doing really amazing things at Cardozo Law School. Uh, so I said, all right, let's, let's try it. Uh, and as, as Leela knows, I, I, har I harassed her and followed her around and said, I want to do this and um, was in the mediation clinic. Um, and so how I got inter interested in this was that it, it, it found me in many ways. I will say, and this might be a question coming up, that um, if you have any kind of passion for this kind of work, which is really about um, positively influencing the, the interactions and relationships that us fellow human beings have with one another and seeing conflict as the opportunity for that kind of um, uh, improvement and in interactions. Take advantage of the time you have as students. It might feel like you have no time, but um, you graduate and you get jobs and families and all that kind of stuff, you're not gonna have as much time and immerse yourself in as many things as you can. You know, the, 
if you if you can't take the mediation clinic, you can take other courses. You can um, you can volunteer, and and that way you you build up a resume, you build up a, a bunch of experience that will make you very attractive in the workplace at a, at a very young age too. So I'm gonna keep asking questions, but I guess our really amazing panelists should feel free to answer the question or say whatever, <laughs> whatever they feel inspired to say at the moment. I'm asking this question because your answer may inspire others to seek something similar to what helped you. So the question, I'm going to use a horse riding term. You probably all know what um, or have heard the term giving somebody a leg up. Well, that comes from horses to get on a horse. Um, somebody, you'll bend your knee and somebody on the ground will well, you'll jump a little bit, the ground person pushes you up, jumps you up on top of the horse. It's called a leg up. That's where the term arose. So the question for the panelists is what, that you haven't mentioned already perhaps, was the biggest leg up for you in getting where you are? You're all in exciting places, um, admirable, places. Can you think of something that was a leg up and hearing it? I mean, Dan, you just said you saw a piece of paper sticking out of a bookshelf and you, it jumped you up. So you have to think of something else. But um, so ideas for what ha have jumped you up to the place you're sitting now. And starting with Krista again. That's a great question. Um, I feel like um, what might be useful, what I might be useful for being on this panel is I graduated last May. So um, I can relate to all the students on this panel um, for having you know, this interest in ADR. What do I do with it? Where do I go with it? Um, in terms of what gave me a leg up, I think we, you've heard it before and we'll say it again, is to be involved. Um, your professors are your absolute greatest resource. I think Kristen gave like a perfect introduction of Professor Love. Um, she, she, she was my leg up, honestly. Professor Love was my, was my leg up. Um, other clinic professors. I worked with Dan White's in the, in the mediation clinic. It's the people, it's the professors and people that you interact with at law school. Um, they are, they are your greatest asset and resource. Um, and I really cannot encourage you enough to take advantage of them. Um, yeah. Well, just to respond to the compliment, Krista. So, both Krista and Kristen have been um, fellows in the QCAN program. Man, have you all and given me a leg up. So it's not just one leg up. I don't like multiple legs up. Students do not realize their power to um, help promote uh, professors and others whose paths you cross. So thank you for that. Um, Camilla. Uh, for me, it's two things. Um, my law degree and my network. Uh, so my law degree, I couldn't build like a legal technology product. I mean, some people do without going to law school, but I think it, it puts me in a really good position to understand like the risks and the implications that are potentially at play when you mix law and automation uh, with <laughs> with each other. Um, and then second, my network, um, it's, they always tell you to network in law school. And again, it was something I was like, ah, like networking, networking. Okay. Um, but without it, um, my business has, I would have, you know, not been able to grow the, at the rate it's growing. Um, within the legal tech community, I like long story short, I moved from New York to California and I'm building a business in California. So I didn't even have a network 
here in California. And I know I mentioned this to Madeline, who's on the call, who reached out to me. Um, I think she's trying to move to California too. Um, but it's, it's all about networking. As an attorney and as a business person, you, it's all sales. Uh, you don't think of it as a sales job, but it is. Um, in order to get clients, and how do you get your clients? Networking. Um, so it's extremely important um, to network with your fellow colleagues. I know it's harder now that you're all remote, um, but the most important network is the one of everyone you're going to school with right now, because in the future, they're going to lift you up and they're going to be thinking, oh, I know um, Krista does that type of area of law. I'm going to send her this client. Um, it's extremely important in the legal profession. Um, and I think something when they say networking in law school, they don't say it as, as like a sales standpoint, but it, it is. Um, and I think that's something I hadn't realized while I was in law school. And I've been able to build it up. Uh, I also just won this award with the ABA. Um, I was an honoree for the Women of Legal Tech. Um, it's a summit that was the past two days, um, which is super cool. And I only got it because of the network I've been able to build in the legal tech community. They were able to nominate me and put me forward for this award. And that is extremely helpful and validating for my career. Camilla. Did you ask anybody to put you forward? I did not ask any. Well, maybe I, was gonna, I retweeted like the tweets uh, about like, look, uh, there's going, ongoing nominations. Um, well, I was the moderator uh, program, so they helped too. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say yes. You all <laughs> should promote yourselves, not in a self-serving or self-seeking. You're doing great things let people know um i can say though uh for this award at cardozo that i got while i was at cardozo my 3l year it was the i can't even remember what it's called but i'll share it later once i think of it um but for that award i had to get my fellow cardozo law students to nominate me for that and i wouldn't have been able to do it if i hadn't asked everyone i knew like krista can you write me a recommendation i think i even asked you professor love like uh, can you write me a recommendation uh, uh and that really helps so you're absolutely right and people want to do it but they're gonna look at what you've done and make their own decisions it's it's fair fair to ask it's good to ask winter so like I was saying before, um, you know, what has really helped me is my network. And I know that this, that's the title of the book is Networked, but it is so a thousand percent true, especially for me building my business in the middle of a pandemic. There's absolutely no way that I could have done it had it not been for the network that I had established going, you know, before I jumped from the law firm to um, an ADR practice, a full-time ADR practice. Now, a lot of people um, it, it will have a law firm career and start to do ADR simultaneously. That's typically what happens. I didn't want to do that. Like I said before, ADR, mediation and arbitration specifically, have always been what I wanted to do. And I, I had identified very early on when I moved here from Florida, I identified the mediators that I most respected. I identified the mediation firm that I most respected. And I worked toward getting toward those people, getting to know those people, getting closer to them, getting in their circle, not in like a creepy, creepy way or whatever, because um, it's happened over the course of, you know, a decade. Um, but I, I looked at their profiles, I looked at their bios, and I, I focused on what they were doing. Like, in, and you'll see this very clearly if you read any of my writing, and especially if you read Networked, but I was very, very deliberate. That was not me. I was very, very deliberate. I have four kids, so it could be, but it's not. I know for sure. Um, 
I was very deliberate in what I was doing. And I was very deliberate in who I was meeting, who I was spending my time with. Like I just said, I have four kids. I'm married. I run three businesses um, right now. I don't have time to waste on anything or anybody. So if I'm going to do something, it's got to mean something. And I, I thank you, Professor, Professor Love, when she was reading through um, some of the things that I'm involved in. I paid attention to what the most successful people in my life were doing and what they were involved in. And those were the things. Okay. And so that's what I did. And while I was working my litigation job, it was nearly impossible to do all those things, take care of my family and, and all of that. So when I decided I was going to fully dedicate, I fully dedicated, quit my job and went forward. I know a lot of people don't have that opportunity, but I was very blessed to have it and ran with it. So what I did was to raise my hand at every opportunity. I wrote at every opportunity and I just created opportunities for myself because, you know, ADR is, is like billed as this very um, kumbaya kind of, kind of profession. It's, it, and it can be, but this, profession is very competitive. It can be extremely cutthroat. You've got to get out there, get your name out there and make opportunities for yourself. Nobody made any opportunities for me. Nobody gave me any opportunities. I have busted my ass for every single one. And when I started and, you know, I was very popular around town and in, you know, I'm licensed in Florida and New York as well but i was i've never lived in new york so the places that i had lived i was pretty popular but nobody knew me as a mediator and arbitrator so it's it's very different but i did have the recognition and the respect from being um a, a litigator at many prominent firms in both locations well florida and new york not florida and new york florida and georgia and so I started creating my own opportunities. I, um, and again, happening during the pandemic when I can't go meet people, my typical ways of, of charming people and going out with them and having drinks and meeting at the lawyer's club, couldn't do that anymore. So I just, I had to brainstorm and figure out what I was going to do. And I was asking people for help and nobody wanted to help me. Everybody, everybody was struggling, right? So there was, there wasn't anyone saying, Winter, here, take this, do this. So I, I sat and I was like, okay, what are the, what are the things that are important to me right now? And at the start of the pandemic, it was being a mom, being home, not having a job at that point, having this brand new business and trying to figure out how I was going to juggle all of these things with, you know, the same 24 hours in a day that everybody else has. And so I thought, if I'm worried about it, everybody else is worried about it. I'm going to produce a webinar and I'm going to sell it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell it to every, every single affinity group that I am involved in. So Again, I want to say volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. That's already been said. It is so true. And so what I was able to do was create a webinar that focused, and this was the first one I did. I created a webinar that focused on mothers, motherhood, and raising children in the time of COVID. And I focused very heavily on how women were losing their jobs and are losing their jobs. You know, we've been, we've been set back, women, um, by, a, by an estimated 25 years, 25 years from COVID. So this was a hugely popular webinar that I gave maybe eight times in the course of a month. After that, requests for me to speak shot through the roof. I continued to create new webinars. I just was, I, I, I read the news thinking about things. What else can I talk about? What came up? Virtual jury trials. I wrote an article about that. It went completely viral. I wrote another article about being a mom, being an attorney and being at home and what that looked like. Another one that went viral. 
So make sure that you aren't relying on somebody to give you a leg up because it may not happen. It did not happen for me. Nobody's helping me now. Um, I do all of this myself. I am self-propelled, self-funded, all of, all of that. Um, but you can do it, is my point. If you pay attention and you focus on what other people are interested in, if you follow the people who are trending and who are at the top um, of the field right now, you can search LinkedIn, hashtag mediation, hashtag ADR, online dispute resolution. Those are the top hashtags um, on the internet right now. If you start following those people, you can figure out what's important and what you should be talking about and start posting about those things. So don't wait for a leg up, create your own leg up, give yourself the leg up, take control of what your what your information is. What does your profile look like? What is your online reputation? I teach classes in that too, but that's not what we're talking about today. But think about all of those things, put them together and, and, and what does it mean to you? Answer that question and you'll be fine. Winter amazing. And if anybody <laughs> wants I always to talk see, too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> if anybody wants to see an example of what Winter does, just look at our chat. There's one thing in our chat. Have a look. It's yeah. from Winter Wheeler to everyone. And it says, <laughs> please connect with me and then gives a bunch of information. There are several people on this call that I'm connected with, which is awesome. So I would, I would love for everybody to connect with me. Um, it's my, it, LinkedIn is my favorite way of communicating with people right now. And um, let's push it forward, y'all. Let's do it. So we're, um, Dan, it's your turn. And I'm thinking you could answer the question on the, table or we can pivot to another question too. Um, what is your big piece of advice to people who think they're inspired about this field in terms of how to promote their career? The topic of this panel. Yeah, that's a that's a much better question to answer, although I'll, I will quickly say the, the leg up um, was clearly Professor Love. Cardozo Law School and, and the students. Um, I could go on forever about the, the ways in which uh, Leela had inspired me, um, even to the point where um, when I was 29 years old, she encouraged me to apply to be the statewide ADR coordinator in New York State at 29 years old. Go ahead, Dan, do it. You could do it, 29 years old. And guess what? At 29 years old, I got the job as a statewide ADR coordinator. Now that happened also because of I think I was I was fortunate um, to connect with someone like Leela. The students, I say, because um, Anders Ericsson says you need to have 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become an outlier expert in something. And my goal was to look if I'm gonna rise to the levels I want to be in this field, then I'm gonna have to become a master. Leela was writing and teaching about master classes and, and so forth. So when, when I started working with students, that was re, refreshing all of the fundamentals. Every year I go back to basics and learn mediation again from the eyes of students who are learning it for the first time. Um, and that connects with my answer to the question about what's the best thing you can do to, to launch a career. Like I said before, there are so many opportunities at a place like Cardozo in particular to, to learn as much as you can and combine theory to practice so that you start getting toward that 10,000 hours. And the truth is it may not be 10,000, it might be 5,000 and so forth. Um, and everything else people have been saying, network, don't rely on other people, do what Winter did and sort of give yourself the leg up. And anyone I've ever spoken to um, in my almost 30 years in the field now who's asked me that question, um, I've said no job that I ever held in the field existed when I was first looking for it. Every job I landed because it just sort of materialized and, and maybe I had some, something to do with it. The skills are transferable and so forth. Um, but just keep taking advantage of the opportunities that are in front of you master the, the skills that you can, network with as many people as you can, and be willing to take risks. Uh, and everyone that has 
um, wanted to do it has succeeded. There are so many examples of individuals um, who couldn't do what the other students in law school were doing. You know, if you want to interview, if you're a 2L um, and, and you want to start interviewing for summer jobs between second and third year, and then you're a 3L, and you're going to know by January or February probably if you have an offer, and you're, you know where you're going to start in September, if you want to go straight into the ADR field, you, you, you're not going to get a job offer in January that you can start in June or, or July. You're going to have to take some risks and, and wait till you graduate study for the bar, pass the bar, and, and take the job. Um, but there's no one route to it. Um, just keep, keep committed to it. You could practice law for several years, come back full time. Um, and it's incredibly exciting, fun, and, and creative. So if you've got any of that entrepreneurship in you, um, you can get it done. So we only, we don't have much time left on this panel. And we the choice is one more round of what's your top piece of advice, everybody taking a minute, or we could open it up to questions. Kristen and Gina, yeah. I don't want to disappoint you. What do you, what do you want to do? So we decided it might be most beneficial for students to actually go with the breakout rooms that we had initially discussed for the last 10 minutes, if that's all right with the panelists. And I've created the breakout rooms already. There's about seven students with each panelist. And that way they can get um, some one-on-one -on -one interactions with the panelists. Great, awesome. So they're all ready and I'll open up the rooms now. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, by the way, for the panelists. If I, I, I'll be here in the main room, of course, when your breakout rooms end, uh, however, I'll set it up so that they'll close automatically after 10 minutes so that you won't be here after your obligation. But uh, thank you so much. It's been truly amazing and a very uh, beneficial experience. Thank you, I'm happy to be here.